And welcome to the Tidbit staff meeting for, oh gosh, what is this, June 26th. Um, with us we have Agen Schmitz, we have Glenn Fleischmann, we have Still Joe Kissel, and Michael Cohen. Hello, everybody. Hi there. Hello. Glenn is actually back. We, last week he was he was on vacation on the East Coast. And, Undisclosed uh, and, locations. And, and we, we assigned him vast amounts of articles last week, at which he didn't watch last week's staff meeting, and so he doesn't know about. But. Ah, that's right. I've done nothing. I've done absolutely nothing, as is my plan. My secret plan. Oh, so, so Joe, you were, you were saying that... Uh, uh, you're, you've been trying to install Mountain Lion on Tiger. Have you gone back to Panther? <laughs> no, there, that that would be uh, that would be a logical impossibility. So there uh, there are a couple of back models that so you know you can look in Apple's Mountain Page website and see a list of what uh, what Mac models support Mountain Lion. And uh, there is uh, there there are iMacs and there are MacBook Pros from I guess 2008 or something that shipped with Tiger originally, which I looked up by using Mac Tracker, but also because I happen to have one. Um, but they also are on the list to support uh, Mountain Lion. Now, of course, the Mountain Lion system requirements say that you have to be running at least Snow Leopard or later. But I was thinking, well, surely there must be some people out there, even if only a handful, who, for whatever reason, are still running Tiger on these machines, but now that Mountain Lion is out, they will decide to upgrade. So using the available tools in their current state, I, I tried to make that happen. And, and as it turns out, um, you know, in, um, in Lion, the Lion installer also would not let you install directly over Tiger, but there was a pretty easy hack that you just sort of, you know, do this thing in current terminal and, and boom, it just works. Um, so it was really just like a switch and the installer was saying, no, I don't think we, we really want to install over that, but if you do, well, it'll work. Well, you do that same little magic trick in current uh, preview of Mountain Lion, and it very much doesn't work. Um, <laughs> I mean, very much. Um, as, as in, you know, you, you, you think you've gone through the whole process, and now all of a sudden you can't log in at all, and, and all your user accounts are gone, and like other, like a whole long list of other th bad things happen. And, and, I, and I did figure out a way to, you know, get past most of those bad things, but I'm not convinced that I found all of them. And so um, I'm, I'm taking pains to say in my book, you really don't want to try this. I did it, but then again, I'm a trained professional with years of experience, and I get paid to do this. You, the general public, should <laughs> not do this. No, seriously, spend the $39, buy the Snow Leopard upgrade, install that, and then do Mountain Lion. If your time is worth anything, you will be a much happier person if you do that. So that's my story. <laughs> well, it doesn't sound Ooh. like that's something we're going to want to be covering in any significant detail. So <laughs> I don't, I mean, I, I did write seven pages about how one might do that, but I don't think we're going to publish that. <laughs> Oh, well, I finally finished my Soho Organizer article, um, which has actually been, been proved, it proved a little more interesting than I had thought, um, both in terms of finding, I don't want to say problems with Soho Organizer exactly, but more thing, I ran, I ran into various issues that I've been working through with them. They actually were great. They, uh, I, I love it when developers, uh, you know, you report something and they say, well, here, try it in this build and give me a new build. So, uh, so that was that was interesting, but uh, I think I just had some corruption in my data, which which was causing problems. And so, for the most part, all that seems to have gone gone away. But the uh, the, the other thing I, I got a comment on the article today from from our, our buddy Norm Harris, and uh, he was saying, well, you know, if you don't like the address address book in Lion with the leather view so much, what uh, what do you know? What do you use? And and the answer has actually been, well, I don't use anything because I don't really use address book on the Mac. At all, I use that. I use contacts in iOS a lot, but not address book on the Mac. And ah, I think it's my phone. And um, and so, uh, but now that I have self organizer. Is it someone else, or is it me? Uh, I don't think it's. I don't think it's me. My phone. Mine doesn't do that anymore. 
Mine does, but the the phone is nowhere near the speakers now. So oh, it doesn't matter. It's 800. It's, here's a lesson of wireless communications, folks. No, I'm sorry. It's 850 megahertz, so it's going to penetrate walls and go. Yeah, but no. Normally, this is not an issue. Normally, when it's, it here, I'll tell you what. I'll, I'll go into airplane mode, and we'll see if it stops. And then suddenly, Adam disappears. Woo! Stop because you picked it up. That's the magic of the iPhone. It's got oh, proximity it irritation testing. Okay, now I'm in airplane mode. So it, <coughs> now, if it now it happens, it's someone else's fault. That's right. Uh, <laughs> so, so somebody's going to come down the aisle now and offer Adam a little bag of pretzels and something to drink. Uh, any event, so so the, the moral of the story was is that although I was actually testing Soho Organizer as a solution to the sinking iCloud contacts into Snow Leopard, oh, I now have a copy on my Lion MacBook too. So <laughs> so it suddenly uh, it suddenly solved the problem of when I have to use address book, uh, now I don't have to. So I don't have to ever deal with that horrible, horrible interface again. So that's a good thing. Let's see. So, other ideas. What's uh, what? What are people? Uh, what are people working on these days? <coughs> My tan. I'm getting nice. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I actually just Breakfast finished an update to uh, my text expander book that's going to be out in a couple of weeks. A revision yes. to take into account the update to text expander. And right now, I'm working on editing uh, Joe's Mail in Mountain Lion book before I go on vacation next week, so I can. Uh, Tell them all the things that, oh, it does this too? Huh. <laughs> yes, I, I am kind of writing three books at the same time, which is... is You're is nuts, Joe. <laughs> normal. It's, it's a situation not to my liking. Uh, you know, I, I really don't believe in multitasking. It's, it's unpleasant for me, so... Uh, but, you, you, you know... But, you you know you need, get that surgery where the, you need to get that surgery where they sever the, uh, was it the, the corpus callosum, and then you can have both brain sides work independently. Then you don't have to multitask. You can single task with each side of your brain. But only one side can draw, then. Mm, I think that's a myth. <laughs> well, well, you know, um, do, do your illustrator book on one side and your mountain lion book on the other. Hmm. <laughs> so what well, you're next month is going to be a, a big a big month for uh, for books anyway. Yeah. So so I think what Joe's saying is no articles from him anytime soon unless they're excerpts from the books. So. Exactly. Excerpts from the books that I can do. Right. Oh, oh there's Jeff. Someone has come to town. Hello. 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 Jeff Carlson. He's very small. Why, Why so am small? I very small? I don't know. Well, give it a second. I I still Why can't see the the hangout yet. Why doesn't Google have the option to automatically resize heads? They can just shrink or enlarge our heads as necessary. You do. You, you go like this. <laughs> it's a pinch. <laughs> Crushing your head. Crushing your, your head. Well, uh, so this, this is last why week, we're I, um, I wrote, uh, I'm going to, uh, on the rest of my laurels, is the airport express, uh, you know, came out, what was it, two weeks ago now? And I wrote something up uh, for that issue about it. And um, it's interesting to get the feedback between that and the Macworld review I did that ran uh, yesterday. It's been interesting to see how many people uh, rely on, you know, a combination of outdated equipment who are trying to do, somebody's typing too loudly. Someone's typing too loudly. Who is it? Ah, this is that luck. You give me that luck. Now it's me. Ha ha. That's why I'm, I'm sorry. My, were you I, talking? I have my soft keyboard. See, can't hear it. Soft keyboard. Um, but the, it's interesting to see. You know, whenever we go through these revisions of airport hardware, uh, what people are thinking about, how they're using it in their network setups, and you know, the Airport Express. Like, I'm getting fascinating feedback both from the tidbits and the MacWorld article about, um, you know, hey, this isn't as portable as it used to be because the plug doesn't come out of the side. I have to use, you know, a long two-prong cable now, which is actually better because if you purchase the external cable, it used to be for the uh, Airport Express, it had three prongs on the end, so it wasn't useful in older houses or older hotels, bed and breakfast. But what um, Apple told me in a background briefing was that uh, they don't see the Airport Express being used as, as a portable unit anymore. So they wanted to keep it small and compact so that, you know, it could be used portably. And I think it's still a great form factor because it's easier to locate it because you've got a six and a half foot cord on it. But uh, at the same time, it's really, it's something people are using in the house. It needs a cord. It should look, um, Jeff Carlson and I were just talking yesterday. I was over at his house while he's trying to, uh, that's him. That's that guy. That guy. Uh, because uh, he was talking about 
extending your network, making your network work in more parts of the house. And his wife does not like the idea of having hardware sitting out, you know, because it's generally ugly, but the new Airport Express, because it's in the Apple TV form factor, is, you know, reasonably attractive and you kind of overlook it. So that might actually be acceptable to be out. And with a long cord, you can locate it somewhere, you know, acceptable as well. So interesting feedback from readers about and about that. And there is also, a, can't you get an, like a firmware update to make it into an air freshener as well? I'm pretty yes. sure. Well, if you run it, if you run enough data through it, it starts to uh, it starts to cook, and you get the nice taste, a nice smell of capacitors. Right. Mm. Capacitors. I'm sure there's I'm sure there's projects on Etsy you can get to disguise it as home furnishings. Oh my gosh! Yeah. Oh, a skirt. You could get an airport skirt. That would be good. You need a little yarn cozy. An, air, an airport cozy, yeah. Airport yeah. cozy. I think we can, well, I do think it's it's funny. I mean, I think that's that notion that like Apple is, you know, they make pretty products. So the Airport Express was probably the ugliest remaining thing. Not me. Was it me here? I'll imply. I'm on airport. Or I'm on think, airport mode. Not um, me. But the airport. Joke. The Airport Express is sort of the ugliest thing that Apple still made. I mean, I think arguably there was nothing uglier than the Airport Express. Well, it looks like a power adapter. What? Yeah, I don't think it was. No, it was fine. It was, no, no. What I'm saying is, I'm not saying it was ugly. I'm saying it was the ugliest thing they made. Right? No, I'm serious hmm. because they have all the, everything's so sleek and perfect and whatever, and this is this kind of big gloppy, you know, adapter. It looked thing, like so. a power adapter. Exactly, but no, I'm not saying it was ugly. I'm saying it's the ugly. <laughs> what, you have to agree. I wouldn't have called it ugly. I would say beautiful. I would say the most retro looking thing. The, the least Apple beautiful product, product they made, and now it looks like other stuff. So, and my contention is. Hey, where's my hockey puck thing. mouse? <laughs> my contention is that the, Air, the Apple TV and Airport Express will merge, I think, because it doesn't make any sense. They're using, a couple people pointed out that the Airport Express still uses this outdated uh, weird analog digital optical output thing, the TOS link, which is used, but it's weird. It uses a mini adapter and whatever. Then that, you know, why won't we have an Apple TV slash Airport Express, like we have a time capsule that does backup. All they have to do is stick an HDMI port into an Airport Express and, and upgrade the processor to what they use in the Apple TV, and you've got a winner. winner. So I'm thinking about that. I don't know. I've got to update my books, my book to reflect it, and um, you know, I've written some things. I'm still seeing if there are more issues to discuss from what people have uh, brought up in various comments. Well, one thing that uh, um, I'm definitely planning on writing about this week, if I can scrape out the time, is uh, to finally cover Trello. Mm. Which we've been using using extremely well for for tidbit stuff. Um, and I was actually curious: um, are, have people started using it for other other things outside of tidbits as well? Yes, I have set up a uh, a little board for our house, uh, Citrus Manor, because uh, my wife uh, has lots of projects in her head that don't often get over to me, and uh, so uh, <laughs> so I'm I'm setting up the board you, right now the later. way the way that I think that we should operate it, and then I'm going to uh, uh, release it uh, in, uh, in beta form to her very soon. Yeah. So you, <laughs> see, you, you need the telepathy API for your wife, is what you're exactly, saying. Exactly, exactly. But, uh, but I'm thinking, you know, with Trello, you know, we, we, you, you'll have like a, you know, a higher, uh, higher level thing like uh, make Sophian's new playhouse. And then you know, be able to comment on well, this is what we need, and blah blah blah. So you know, Trello, I think, works a lot better for that rather than you know, like reminders or even uh, OmniFocus that I also use. So we 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 have sort of the same thing where you have a, just a home board where you know it's stuff we have to do for the house, and you know, we have a tree that needs to come down, and I, you know, Tanya added added a card for that, and I was you know kind of poking around the board yesterday, I saw the card, and thought, oh, I should you know. Put in, a, put in a, a two item to you know call the people or whatever, and I looked up the people to find their phone number. It turned out they did email, and so I was able to just email them. So the the whole project you know almost got done just by actually seeing that kind of that that little reminder there. But we're also planning to do one for uh, uh, Christmas presents, where we just have a list for each person, and you can put down ideas, and you can you will do use tags to say whether we've gotten them or if it's in wrapped or mailed or all those kinds of little things that you need to track. Uh, and so, but it's been it's been really it's been very impressive just how flexible it is, and and you know I can certainly see ways that it can improve, but uh, on the whole, I'm just I'm really really liking it. Me too. It's and it's, it's free, uh, which is just crazy. <laughs> yeah, it's the best new software that I use. I have to say, I was I was feeling that way about Coda too. 
Um, interesting. I'll I'll give you a coda on coda. That's sort of related to Trello. So, um, you know, when you you get new software, it's like we've all used thousands and thousands of applications and websites, and you rarely get excited about something new because usually there's so many trade-offs. And Trello feels like something that has very few trade-offs and works very much the way that I think, and the workflow is very clean. And I felt that way about Coda initially, uh, Coda 2, and I found that maybe half of it is perfect and wonderful in every way, and the other half is maddeningly frustrating. So I'm trying to figure out how to reconcile that. Hmm. Isn't that a little what you ran into early on, Joe, with the first version? Yes. Yes. <laughs> you know, I, I wrote about what I thought were the really uh, you know, frustrating, irritating things and I really couldn't find anybody to agree with me, so, okay. So that's kind of where I'm at is I think it's, a, I want Trello and CSS edit to merge uh, from MacRabbit. I've actually had email exchanges with various Coda. people. Not, not going to happen. Edit. Coda, I'm sorry, Coda too, yeah, yeah because uh, Coda 2's support for CSS is, uh, it's strong if you know, if you've memorized all of CSS. I know all of HTML. HTML is a relatively small set of things, and if I don't remember an attribute while I'm typing, Coda 2 will prompt and give me the attribute list for a CSS uh, tag, and that's great. But I mean, for a, a HTML tag, HTML is small. CSS is vast and complicated. I don't have, I'm not Eric Meyer, I don't have all CSS memorized and know exactly what it does. So it's very, very hard for me to construct a CSS selector by hand using Coda's tools. Very easy in, uh, in MacRabbit's uh, CSS edit, and which they incorporated into uh, Espresso 2. Um, I like it better as a standalone program. So anyway, but it's, it's interesting. I mean, I think Trello is a great example of having a very tight focus and creating a web app that's so seamless, I forget I'm using a web app. You drag and you drop, it refreshes, it updates live while people are doing things. It's, I, I don't know, I think it's one of the best web apps I've ever used. I think it's better than Google's apps in terms of like interactivity, freshness and, and intuitiveness? Well, Google, Google Analytics, which used to be a, mm. I mean, a, a fairly impressive web app and, and um, you know, relatively easy to move around and whatnot, since they've been, been updating it and, you know, adding more features and whatnot, it feels, it feels slow and clumsy now. Mm. I'm, I'm constantly lost in it. I can no longer find my way around. And I don't know what to do in Google Analytics. Like, I click on things and I'm like, I think this means that. And it doesn't, Jeff Carlson and I are having this discussion about iMovie yesterday where I've been using iMovie, I'm going to start a Kickstarter project, a book about crowdfunding, and I'm making a video for it with some help from many people, including Jeff Carlson, thank you, Jeff Carlson. And um, so I'm working on uh -huh. iMovie, and I haven't worked extensively in the new version until now, and the more I get to use it, the more aggravating I find it because uh, even though I can use it better, it doesn't reward my knowledge. Every time I learn something, I can't apply it elsewhere. And the contextualness, like I want to do something in iMovie, and I click where I think it should happen, but the menu isn't there. I have to click on a gear icon to get audio settings, but if I double click it, so it doesn't have that intuitive feel of, of older Mac apps where you could kind of just do stuff and it happened and you'd be rewarded by right choices. I feel like I'm constantly penalized in iMovie by wrong choices. There's only hmm. one way to do it right. And if you don't get it, then you know your clip's missing and you've got to undo and whatever. Do you think it's a, is it kind of like a mystery meat interface? Is that what you're describing? No, it's just that, you know, that there's each clip, you have so many different approaches that have different choices for each thing you can do. And like, I still don't understand entirely the difference between clips and project, even though I should, even though I've been using it now for weeks and weeks. And I, I mean, I, I do sort of get it. Like, I know that the project is where the full clip, or the clips are where the full movie item lives, but it handles audio and video differently, and you can drag stuff in, and then it's like, you can't duck. Oh, did Jeff write a book about it? What's that? <laughs> wow. Yes. I don't know if that would actually help me, though. I don't know if that would make me less aggravated. Like, understanding it, the more I understand it, the more I think it would, it's an imperfect interface that's not designed around the way people think or do things, but around the way that the people wanted to program it. It's got that, um, you know, engineer feel to it. Does this feel like it's something that Apple's doing um, potentially intentionally and more generally? Because that's actually very much how I found iPhoto 11 to be. That I mean, I'd written books about every version of iPhoto, so I really understood iPhoto, and, and it seemed pretty straightforward for a long time. And then with iPhoto 11, particularly when I went to the full screen interface, the whole thing just, it, it boggled me. You know, that it was, you know, that, that controls were all over the place. I had different ways of working. If I was depending on which mode I was in, certain things would work in some places and not others. 
and and I just in particular in full screen mode you lose the menu bar kind of by default. I mean obviously you can get it back, but you know the implication is that everything you need to do is visible to you, but it's clearly not. So you that's know, I where wonder I, if there's some design aesthetic there that's we're not liking. I, I, think, I think there's oh sorry please go ahead. Uh, I, was gonna, I, I think a lot of that is because iPhoto is like 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 the the transition bridge between you know Mac apps that we've known you know for a long time and the new idea of you know things are more like iOS more you know everything must be right there and you know I mean iPhoto 11 came out in October 2010 so it's like a year and a half old before uh, Lion before that 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 sort of merger and I, I mean I completely believe that iPhoto was like like the test balloon <laughs> and and then they lost the balloon and it's just floating out there somewhere they don't know how to find it <laughs> which you know I, I mean and my guess is is they're going to let that that balloon just you know drift off into the sun because the next iPhoto will probably look a lot more like iPhoto on the iPad but but here's here's my thing is I find myself baffled with Apple applications in a way like it makes me you feel don't like know how I'm to suddenly use computers that's your problem I know that's I feel like an I feel like a, a person a person of age a person of age <laughs> who grew up before a computer existed I mean I've been using software since I was 11 and or even earlier than that and I don't ha I don't remember ever having the same sense of being lost the way I am with some of Apple's apps now that I was back when. Um, you know, like this is the way I used to feel with like Windows 95 or Windows. You want to run apps. iMovie from the command line, don't you? Yes, that's it. I need command line driven. Uh, no, it's just you know. I mean, it's I, you wrote yeah. a book about it, you know, and it's it's um, yeah, it's just it's baffling why you would build an interface that that you have to. I mean, I thought good software rewards you for learning, and I don't feel like Apple's newer software rewards me in the same way with experimentation. I feel like it's I'm getting zapped. I'm being tased all the time. Well, I think what Apple's doing is, um, and, and you know, I think this also kind of com comes up with Final Cut Pro 10, is um, I, before the idea was, okay, you can sort of find everything. If if it's not a button, then it's a menu item. If it's not a menu item, then it's you know, it may be buried in a, in a control um, uh, uh, palette. Yeah, and so you know, like like there were at least a couple of ways to do things, and now I think what Apple may be maybe doing is they're thinking, okay, <clears throat> you know, we've we've figured out a better way to do things so that once you know how to do this baseline level of things, then your interaction with it is much faster. So, you know, once you know that in order to do all sorts of effects in iMovie, you have to drag a clip onto another clip, not just mm -hmm. into the, the, the project field, but drag it like onto the middle of the clip, and then you get this pop-up menu that has like ten items where you can do, you know, um, um, you know, inserts and, and, and replaces and um, the thing that I wrote you about yesterday that I'm totally forgetting about. Some um, crossover and a crossover. Yeah, yeah. Cross you know, dissolves. But, no, well, no, um, cutaway, yeah. cutaway. That's what it is. Cutaway. Um, okay, yeah. You know, yeah, but it's, um, it's baffling because I couldn't figure out where. I mean, it's not everything doesn't have to be in a menu, but there's still that notion right. that even in a professional grade piece of software, which iMovie, I mean, I know Final Cut Pro is that is uh, mm -hmm. fills that role, but it's uh, I've used professional software. I mean, I've used everything from software intended for people who've never touched a computer for before to people who have to have extremely detailed. Uh, uh, domain specific knowledge and I, I don't know I feel a little bit lost these days I, I have the same problem with iPhoto with less than my movie because you can't do as much with it but then I'm constantly trying to figure yeah. out what I'm supposed to do I'm like where is this so, why do I click this how do I select it so so I, so I'd like to, to to take this sort of up a level of abstraction um, is this perhaps happening because Apple is changing sort of the linguistic underpinning of how we use things. Mm, I, I think the, you're probably user, right. Their user interface model has, is beginning to change. There's, there's not a consistency to it anymore. It's been, it's well, been spread around. Oh, and I'm talking off the top of my head here, but it seems as though there is that in, in the past, you know, sort of the classic Mac approach, it was a noun-verb situation. You would select yes. an object, and then you would act on it. Mm -hmm. And particularly with the move to iOS, 
it feels as though there's often no noun. That you're hmm. just verbing. Yes, but 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 you're verbing physically on an object, but you don't know you can do it until you touch that object. There's nothing to differentiate an object that you can pinch, for example, and one that you can't visually. Right. And yeah. it's actually, when you do in iOS get that noun-verb combination, it actually feels a little weird a lot of the time when you, you, you tap edit and then you have to, you know, click a check, tap a checkbox next to the photos you want to delete and then click the delete, tap the delete button. You know, that right. feels like an awkward interface in iOS. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, you know, something that iOS is not designed for. But it feels as though there's something different about mm -hmm. wh what Apple's been designing of late that may They're be informed local. by iOS. They're localizing a, a number of commands directly within the objects that you manipulate. And oh, that, make, yeah. that hides them because you don't see the user interface, you see the object, so you don't know what commands it has inside of it. Yeah, so it's just, like, you know, just like in, in mail, you know, when you're looking at a message, there, there are these controls that only appear when the pointer goes ov over that sort of divider between the header and the message. Oh, yeah. And there, yeah. there are kind of a lot of places like that in, in Mac OS X where the control, you have to know where the controls are supposed to be and go there before oh. they show up. Yeah, the you classic thing is yeah, the scroll no, bar. There, there's a target acquisition problem. You can't just say, I'm going there, so zoop, you know, you have to, you know, if, if you don't know it's there and where it is, out of luck. This is the classic problem yeah. with the, the scroll bars in Lion. That's the seminal example, right, is that Lion out of the scroll bars where unless you hover over them, you don't know that scroll bars even exist. You can't see the position you are in a document. It's not right. exposed. And I found that maddening. And, I still find and, that maddening in line. And the same thing in any of the documents that implement say, You don't realize that the name of the document of the top of the title bar is a control until you mouse over it. Oh, look, it's a drop-down right. menu. Oh, I can right. lock right. it or unlock yes. it and go yes. back in versions or you know, have it uh, brush my hair. You don't know right. that. I think mm -hmm. it's a think, this is a good think piece. Is the is the implicit actions that it's it's actions that are verbs attached to objects instead of because the, the interfaces are no longer discoverable. They're not rewarding and right. they're not discoverable. You have to become an expert. Well, but it's weird because at the same time, if you emphasize this sort of touch approach that's in iOS, iOS does reward touching and experimentation. There's rarely something you do in iOS in Apple's yeah. apps or other apps that make you feel bad because you couldn't figure it out. It has to be intuitive at a level, and Apple enforces that even with, you know, app store rejection sometimes if it doesn't think that things meet that standard. So it's weird that Mac OS X is becoming less, dis I mean, I've always said, like, here's the thing, like, what a good piece of software is deep and rewarding is the more you use it, the more you find things you didn't know were in it, and the more you experiment and work with it, you're rewarded by more and more knowledge that comes and unfolds to you. And we're talking about something like the opposite. It's not, it's, it's deep and very, very shallow, like, you know, spiky, like, or low trench places, like crevasses, and it doesn't and that's because you. It's punishment. Punishment and crevasses. Well, the, the user interface language, rather than being a clear linguistic development, if you will, has become a creole. <laughs> Very and, nice. And I, only speak it's pigeon, a creole, I only speak the pigeon you version, though. Okay, you, don't but, have, but you don't have a reliable grammar anymore because there's two grammatical models kind of intersecting in bizarre ways. But let's attempt the the improbable. Let, let's. <laughs> All that is left is the you know the the, the, the scary That's and our model. Thing. Okay, now let's let's imagine that we are Apple. Let let's try to put ourselves in Apple's shoes. Why might they be doing this? Can we come up with a plausible theory or a few plausible theories as to why they might be obviously deliberately oh, yeah. taking this approach? If I am Apple, then everything you guys say doesn't matter. That's End of story. The, oh, sorry. No, it's it's clearly it's an attempt. Story. I think it's the I think it's a wrong-footed attempt to make things simpler. Like Apple is still trying to crack the code of how do you get the hundreds of millions of people who don't own a Mac and don't want a computer. Like for some people, mm -hmm. that's going to be the iPad or an iPhone or iPod Touch now. But for people, they still want to sell Macs. They still make you know their thirty something percent margin on it. And there's still yeah. plenty of people who they want to get them to buy more Apple software, do more Apple stuff, buy from the App Store, and I uh, the Mac App Store. And I think I think by hiding complexity. I believe Apple thinks they're making it easier, and I think it's the wrong thing. It's that you they're hiding complexity by attaching it to objects, and that is the wrong approach because it frustrates both new users who don't know a function exists. They have to learn it. It frustrates sophisticated users. If you know, it would, it would work okay in a perfect world, but okay, let's take the Apple TV. Now, recent, a recent update added a, a software restart command. 
Yes, I found it. It didn't used to be one. And I can't yeah. tell you how many times I had to pull the plug on that damn thing yeah, because yeah. it crashed. It stopped working. Mm -hmm. right. There isn't anything else that you can do. There's no power button. There's, I mean, there wasn't anything else I could do when it stopped working except to unplug it and replug it. Mm -hmm. Now, at least when it doesn't completely crash, at least when only part of it mm -hmm. stops working, I have the option to do a software reset, which is very nice. I've but, had to do I mean, how many people, recently, since they how many the people have, button, have, have brought times. home their shiny new iMac and they plug it in? They're like, "Where's the power switch?" Like, and you got to really hunt for it, you know? Like, if you don't know where it is, I mean, it's, it's hidden in the back there where you're never going to see it, and it's, you know, flush against the surface, and it's, it's tiny. You know, it's like you have to know. Now, I, I, have, I have a theory, and I'm not sure if this is a legitimate theory. It's sort of a, it's sort of a play theory. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but, I, but, I, but I came upon this theory after watching Lost, and especially after hearing J.J. <laughs> Abrams talk about Lost. <laughs> Awesome. Um, he he did a TED talk on on you know his his sort of approach to mystery, and 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 so my 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 play theory is Apple is doing these things deliberately to engage users to make them to make them look to 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 set them on a treasure hunt, um, because you know this this gets people to play more and it gets lots and lots and lots of people who have discovered these things to write about them and blog about them. And there are, you know, there are whole, you know, tip sites and, you know, parts of our, our own publications that exist solely so that we who have gone on these treasure hunts can, you know, convey this knowledge. And so Apple is getting all this, all this free press and all this buzz and all these people who are like, oh, you know, let me, let me shake it. What if, I, what happens if I press here and, you know, twist it this way? And, and so my, my theory is that they're, they're doing this deliberately as as a way of you know because because mystery is interesting because you you want to see what happens next what other little gems might be stored inside here you might discover something really cool. Well, this is the hmm. the, the, the the way I would actually characterize that Joe. Um, I've, I've internally thought of this as the Super Mario problem. Huh. Yes. You know that in essence, Apple is saying the interface that people of a certain age on the younger side of the platform um, that they are sort of growing up with is this video game interface where you've got to hunt for everything. Yeah. Where yeah. where the entire universe is exploratory and you know and, and it's up to you to, to to make sense of it. And so I guess I wasn't thinking of so much of them doing it intentionally to engage people more, although I kind of like that. I mean I was thinking of it more as a, as a reflection of Trying to make some things more the way that those that people with that background would think of them, which of course would drive those of you know us on this in this hangout nuts because as as is fairly obvious, uh, you know we're old. We're old, yeah. Exactly. You, you know that that we Speak all we ourselves. all more or less post date Mario. So um, I never dated Mario. <laughs> post date. Oh, I'm sorry. Date like him afterwards. Didn't like the mustache. <laughs> So uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, it is an interesting, it's an interesting question, and I, I sort of wonder if there's, you know, any of the Don Norman kind of people who have written about this uh, as an as an approach, because I I would think that it would be very much sort of against traditional usability, and it's certainly, you know, a lot of the things that I see, I think this is nuts. You know, how can they be it, doing this? This is terrible it, usability. It, 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 go, it goes against a number of basic tenets of usability, the ideas of discoverability and, mm -hmm. and having a scent for where the information is hidden. You know, there are trails to lead you there. Yeah, and I don't know where to look for anything. Yeah, yeah. And it doesn't entice you into doing it. Um, uh, well, the same interface works so well on iOS because from the get-go, you're used to touching stuff. And, you, you're and there, not, there aren't any invisible control. I mean, you know, say what yeah. you will about like you know the weird you know verbs are in the object thing, but uh, at least at least at least the objects are visible. You know, the, yes. you, you don't have to like hover over an invisible button on your iPhone to get it to magically appear. Right. It's gonna, at least going to be visible. Well, yes and no, though, because often in iOS you do end up with with you know like entire screens which can be hidden because you have to know that you can swipe in a particular direction. Yeah, yeah, okay. I've had um, that happen recently with a few things, yeah. So, I mean, I actually find, I find iOS not undiscoverable. Bye, Agon. 
I didn't quite realize Iowa was waving goodbye. Um, and I find the certain things in iOS to be somewhat un undiscoverable. And I think the I think the hint there, honestly, is the number of apps I just for some reason downloaded Google Current recently, um, even though it's not terribly new. And they had to give me the you know the five little uh, little slide five screen slideshow on how to use the app. I mean, anytime you have to do that, I think that's a hint that it's not discoverable. Yep. And certainly every ebook reading program on the planet has to give you something along those lines because, you know, this whole swiping left and right and all that, that's not <laughs> yet. I mean, my problem is so, so I'm like, I just want to use the damn thing. And so I, I just zip past the little tutorial and then I'm, I'm using them like, uh, yeah. I, you can't get I, back. I needed that. How do I get it back? Where do I go to find that? You need, it's you gone. Need you need a tutorial to find out how to get to the That's door. right. Yeah, the tutorial itself told me how to do it. Uh, yeah, then I went up to the website, and I either play the video from the website of the tutorial, or it does tell you it's like, oh, if you need to see the tutorial again, I'm like, no. Uh, yeah, exactly. And we um, all go insane. There, there's, there's something else that, that kind of feeds into this sort of interface, and that is, you know, the development of how object-oriented programming works and how you can have these objects that float around, actually from OS to OS in the Apple world, that contain their own internal commands and properties and ways of operating upon themselves. And that's another reason that you start to bury commands inside of the actual object rather than having well, yes, a link no, to I, a controller think, that links to something else. I think you might actually be onto something there because you know you are exactly right. Object-oriented programming does put you know the the verbs and the nouns sort of in this in the same container, mm -hmm. and and it, this could be an instance of let you know Apple letting engineers design the interface, and they're, they, so so engineers are going to think like that. Engineers are going to think that oh yes, of course we have to we have to package the verb inside the noun, um, but ordinary people don't think that way, and of course Apple doesn't believe in usability testing, so. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and certainly you, you, with the, you, know, you get you get inheritance and you know, the child objects and the parent objects and all of that kind of stuff as well, which, you know, again, from a logical engineering standpoint, can make a ton of sense, but it isn't necessarily the way that you want to look at things from the outside. In some cases, their child objects have become, you know, teenagers that are having, you know, like problems relating to their parents. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, uh, I mean, the other thing that, that, that this reminds me of is, because we run into this whenever we start writing about Apple stuff, is if you read what Apple writes, they actually don't talk about their, their interfaces in the same way we do. Mm -hmm. right. We'll almost never use explicit terms, for instance. Right. And they, they will never say, click the such and such button. They, or, you know, they'll, they'll never say, like, go to the such and such view of the such and such tab of the such right. and such pane. They will say, click this click this, then click this. You, yeah. So you, you have to go through it step by step. You do not assume that objects have names. Right. And, there are, and, and they only show you a picture of the object. Right. And yes, they, click they, the... Which, which in some sense probably, I wonder if they do that in part because of localization. Probably. It, it, in part but, it is a localization issue, but then it also raises uh, accessibility issues. And uh, they sometimes don't always follow through on that. Well, like, you know, obviously, th th this is something we've encountered many times in the take control world, is we want for our books to be readable by screen readers, and so we have to, sp we can't just stick in an icon because a computer can't read that. So we have to fig either figure out or make up names for everything that we see on the screen. And sometimes those are not terribly easy to find out. And even, you know, you can use voiceover and find out what Apple calls them, but that might not be necessarily an obvious term. So we don't always agree with what Apple calls it, even though it's their interface, because they make yeah. bad choices about what they call things. Well, and sometimes, sometimes what they call it actually are, are we have to go to the developer documentation, for instance. Right. Yeah. yeah. So you can end up with some really weird names because it's what the developers call it. Because it turns out, if you're programming, you have to know what you're calling it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's sort of this. The yeah, this programming is the most text. <laughs> yeah, those people care. So, but it, you know, I, I find it. I mean, I, I, I almost, I mean, one of those things you sort of want to be, you know, you want to really, like, sit someone down and just ask them these questions because, you know, did they come up with this style of not naming anything um, intentionally or did they just sort of fall into it because of localization issues or a style guide where one person said this is, this is you know, a style we want to have because we believe it is more, you know, obvious 
and uh, you know, or another example, you know, we don't, they don't, they don't name their model. You know, no, Max don't have model numbers. So you know, you're constantly coming up with these sort of weird, fakey names for things because the MacBook you do Pro care was that written into the mid 2008 Mac Pro, as opposed to the 2009 Mac That's Pro right. or whatever. It's, and it's so ridiculous because Apple's support pages actually have charts that tell you how to interpret the non-existent names of the things that they have because they don't name them. And you're like, what? Huh? Yeah, but that's all sales. I mean, that's, that's, you know, you want a MacBook Pro, you get the MacBook Pro. You want an iPad, you get the iPad. I mean, it, it's all, it's they, all they related could to quietly sales call it. Stuff. You could say you get the iPad. They could advertise the stores of the iPad, and it could say in small type underneath the iPad 3 or the iPad 2012 or the iPad, you know, 5.7. Or, 5. or 7. even be on the back of the, of the device. Yeah, what I mean, it's like you somewhere know, it doesn't have to be part of the branding. It just, it just has to be, instead of A99376-M or whatever their terms are internally. Well, in fact, this is something I, I talk about in the upgrading book because, you know, you can, you can look at this chart and say, all right, well, you know, if I have a you know, mid-2009 or later Mac blah, 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 then it'll run Mountain Lion. So you're like, well, you know, gee, I, I bought my Mac... In uh, in late 2009, I think it was late 2009, or was right. it 2000? Did I, I? I think I bought this one used. So, but like, I when was it manufactured? Know. Well, you know, you can look on it. There's no label. Um, now there is a way of finding that designation. And if you're running Lion, you have to hunt for it. But if you're running Snow Leopard, it, there there is no place inside your computer, no place you can look that'll say. I am an iMac mid-2010. You know, you can only find that in line or later. And so, um, and, it's, and it's not particularly easy to find. So, where is it? Ah, yeah, so. okay. Ah, in Lion, go, go, to, go to About This Mac and I'm click More there. Info. Now, what this does is it opens oh, a special system window system in System oh. Information. It's oh. System Information window menu About This Mac or Command I. Oh, that's new. I hadn't looked. Oh, this is the summary screen, and there it is. And it says this is a mid-2011. Well, that's mm -hmm. handy. That's actually, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's handy, but you didn't know about it until I just told you. Nobody no, knows looked, about yeah. this. I didn't even know they changed it from system profile to system information. I vaguely oh, recall that. But, oh, this is incredibly useful. This is, incredibly, this is one of the most useful things Apple's done, and I was unaware of it. How nice. They, because like they don't tell us anything. They, right, Glenn. Glenn. <laughs> yeah, I don't read books. Sorry, I know. I don't read but you know, they, 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 they release the software updates. And, and, and the description of the software update is, we recommend this for all users of, of whatever. Mm -hmm. they, they literally do not tell you anything about what this will do. And this is sort of, the, you know, they could add features, they could take away features, they could change names, change anything, and they won't tell you. You just have to discover it. You have to go on the treasure hunt. You have to go looking for those mysteries. Otherwise, you I think this would be a, well. I think there'd be a good it's Portman Co. article that's about the Apple the Apple e Apple uh, egg hunt. It, these aren't Easter eggs. These are like these are like uh, going back to school eggs. These are work eggs. <laughs> this is all part of Apple's long term media process. They'll eventually have their own cable network, and it'll have a, a show called Name That Thingy. <laughs> I thought it's part of their attempt to get us to stop writing about them because we're so frustrated with the uh, trying to sort things out. But I know, know what it's be. There won't be any words to describe these things, so ha, that'll put them in their place. Well, yes. It'll be all pictograms. We were talking on... In a and here's my modern dance review of Airport Express. We were, we were talking on <laughs> the, the incomparable podcast the other day about uh, to make Hugo a, make a wave. Books. Hugo nominated books and uh, George R. R. Martin, you know, writes these uh, these uh, squirrel killing books. They're so huge, you could just kill a squirrel or a small dog with them. And the joke was, you know, George R. R. Martin writes books that prevent anyone from having the time to read anything else during a given year. So of course, it'll win the award because you can only have time to read his book. And I think Apple sometimes has that fill the zone. There's so much stuff going on; it's so hard to figure out, you know, what to call things, how to use things. Like, there's no time to actually do critique or analysis. We just have to, to keep up on the documentation. Side. And hmm. I've killed the conversation. Good. Well, this call's about over. <laughs> <laughs> new I was just and thinking and about that George R. R. Martin song that uh, has been making the rounds on YouTube lately. I don't dance with dragons. That's what we'll have to, I'll have to see if we can come up with an article about this stuff, because I do think it's interesting, and I think it's it may account for some of the unsettled feeling that 
people who have been using the Mac for a long time are getting more and more, um, where you you sort of feel like you don't like you don't have the skills anymore, or, or <laughs> things are a little clumsy, or you know, I mean, honestly, for you know, for me, I was like, you know, I don't feel like an iOS expert, you know, that I, I, I'm not, I just can't be as fluid in iOS. I'm, I'm more error prone. I'm constantly doing the wrong thing in iOS. The mistakes are all small. You know, I press the home button when I meant to click a back button or something. But, but it's, you know, it's definitely, do I don't get that, that kind of uh, uh, fluidity and that sense that, you know, I can move incredibly quickly and, and do exactly what I want with no errors at all, which I have on the Mac um, when I'm using the apps that I'm familiar with. Yeah, they're, they're getting yeah. further and further away from the, the TOG model of uh, interface design. Yeah. Do you remember TOG on interface? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, yeah. Nice guy. I met him once. Yes. Instead of writing an article about this... We did a modern dance. <laughs> did no. That. We, we did a tidbits present on it. Ooh. So oh, we, we, we spend more time <laughs> you know, individually and, and cooperatively hashing this out um, maybe we come up with some slides or some, you know, visual demos of, of what we're talking about, but we wouldn't necessarily say we're presenting our unified vision of what we think is going on, but we would, we would talk about it and we would each show some things and we would take questions or, you know, complaints from the audience and we'd make it a, a big, like, interactive video thing, like this. Hmm. That's wow. Hmm. We could, uh, yeah. I have to. We just have to sort of think about how to break it up in terms of who was going to do, who was going to talk about what. A little bit of organization there. I think it's a job for Trello. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the circuit is now complete. The circuit. Um, yeah, no. I think that I think that might be a, a good way of doing it because because you're, you're right. And this is stuff you kind of want to show. Yes, mm -hmm. very much so. Very yeah, much. Bring so. up screen captures. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, and just, you know, and, and it would be interesting, for instance, to show the difference between the way Apple writes some instructions and the way we write some instructions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, you know, and, or Glenn, you know, the sort of the, 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 the problems you're having with finding things in iMovie or, you know, the difference between iPhoto, you know, iPhoto in full screen mode versus not, what, that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. So, okay. No, what, would be, what would be a practical upshot of this other than... Listen to the tidbit staff bitch about Apple. <laughs> What's what, not fun about that? Come on. <laughs> no, right, it's definitely but, entertaining. Well, it, it, but it's, well, aside from being entertaining, it's also, I think, in some ways helpful because I'm sure there are people out there who've had a lot of the same questions about how things work. And by understanding how the models have begun to collide in uh, UI land in the Apple mm -hmm. universe, they may at least come away with a few more tools about how to discover things that weren't the way you discovered things before. The, the, the reason I think this is a neat idea is because of this very conversation we're having now, is that none of us knows what's going on. We can only guess, and we all have ideas that we can contribute to the discussion that might be right or totally wrong, mm -hmm. um, but we've all noticed different things that other people haven't noticed. And um, so I just think that would be much more much more interesting and much more useful, especially if people can, you know, inject their own questions than all of us just saying, well, you know, here's, here's a list of our complaints or the things we've noticed or our, you know, one, one theory that we have, we have edited together about why this is because, I mean, I, 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 that, 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 found, that, that sounds like a very, very hard article to write. It, it feels like we might never get it right and it might just go into, you know. Yeah, yeah, the usual limbo land. Yeah. 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 The yeah okay well I said I mean I think this is the sort of thing that it might actually be worth you know building an entire Trello board around um, and then almost storyboarding it with the cards. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I will I will I will take the task of doing that, but I'm not going to make a task for myself in Trello to do it. I'll just do it. So. <laughs> um, and uh, and yeah, and we can and we can decide. Maybe it'll be you know live for tidbits members only, and uh, and everyone else can come watch later. That's right. a good. That's right. a very interesting idea. I yes. like that. Our members would probably like that too. For our our loyal and much appreciated members. Can and we rig it so that listening? so that only tidbits members can ask questions, and and non-members can only watch? 
No, you can't rig it. Um, this is something we've been looking into with Google Hangouts. Mm -hmm. um, but basically, what it comes down to is having a, a think of it as a presentation in a university auditorium, and yeah. you can't pe walk people block people from walking by and sticking their heads in. So you just don't tell them that it's happening. Gotcha. So the only people who would know exactly when it's happening are the people we chose to inform, to, and okay. and anyone else who walked by randomly. Right. So. And we don't Fair really enough. care. I mean, not that big a deal. Precisely. So, okay. Unless Kim well, Kardashian's on the uh, podcast. So. <laughs> <laughs> and then hopefully well. people will just stay away. Yeah, right. <laughs> we'll just tell everyone except members that Kim Kardashian's on, and that'll do it. That's right. <laughs> They'll all go to this hangout over here, and then we'll have a really good discussion over here. That's right. That's why uh, uh, I've, someone I know once labeled his pornography as military manuals. <laughs> <laughs> no one ever went into that box. He was, pl plausibly, he was in the military, so that's how he got it. I'm glad he didn't put it in the ammunition box. This military is how to strip your gun. <laughs> ah. That's what happiness is, a warm gun. <laughs> I say you look like you're opening a present. Did you just get something? <laughs> oh, no, no. I, I'm just putting my uh, rainbow hat away. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, or, uh, which is actually, it, it's, it's, a, it's an umbrella hat. Michael is scrambling to hide his porn. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, an, um, it's an umbrella hat that was handed out at Semantic, but it's a lovely uh, rainbow cursor of death. I was going to say, my... On Semantic? I got this from Semantic, yes. Uh, we, we had a staff meeting that was held outside on a very hot summer day, so they handed these things out. So we wish... Guest appearance. Everybody say hi, Tanya. Hi, Tanya. Hi, hi, hi. And you would wear them. Get a mouse. Uh, I have a mouse. In the closet. A good mouse. In the closet. Uh, a good mouse. I don't think Happiness a good is a good mouse. A mouse. <laughs> Because I have to use my Bluetooth mouse with Mountain Lion now, so I can do all this. Oh, hey, uh, no, no. Oh, my God, she just ruined all NDAs. <laughs> no, there's no problem. Don't say. Now everybody knows that there's no Bluetooth in Mountain Lion. Damn it. <laughs> there is no bomb in Gilead. <laughs> okay, so... Um, We've reached that point. So episode. other other articles, um, um, Marshall Cloud just wrote something about Calipin, which was that clever little Dropbox-based blogging service. Yes. I guess yeah. it's gone open source. Yes. The guy uh, guy doesn't want to do it himself anymore, so that's open source. I need to look at that. <laughs> so it's and, dead. Um, In other words, it's Steve gone McCabe, forever. Steve our, uh, our New Zealand correspondent, um, uh, was visiting his family back in the UK <laughs> when he had troubles with his iPhone and tried to get it replaced, and apparently that led to all sorts of interesting discussions with Apple because they claimed that they couldn't replace it because it was different from the UK phone. And, ah, and I thought it was a world phone. Oh, that's all point. But, he <coughs> wouldn't, but, they wouldn't, but they wouldn't tell him how it was different. Of so, course. And, and he's like, they didn't I'm have a words physics for teacher. It. You can use the big words. <laughs> so in any event, he wrote a, a rather amusing little article about that that I'll be uh, editing up and hopefully getting posted shortly. So, um, But any other ideas? Uh, we've, we've got a couple of text uh, uh, watch list items for Agon that, uh, that I know he's working on. Uh, KeyQ from Ergonis just revved. And um, um, I just got a ping from Naomi, so I think we'll probably be having another one shortly which I won't say anything about in case I suspect it's still under NDA. And mm -hmm. Don't usually break our NDA. So. In my case, I, I need to focus on uh, Joe's book this week before I go on vacation, so I probably don't have any articles yeah. to write, although I still want to do that uh, idle push article, yes. which I might write while I'm uh, up in Portland. Well, you're idle if we push yes. it. Yes, yes, exactly. Got it. <laughs> Okay, and Glenn, um, we need you and I need to talk uh, later today about um, where we are in some of the site stuff. I need to get a new uh, a new SSL cert and that kind of thing. Yes. So, all right. Well, otherwise, thank you if that's it. Uh, thank you very much for coming, and I will talk to you all offline and then again next week. Thanks for watching, folks. Bye-bye. Bye, folks. Bye.